Hi everyone, my name is Annie Krapik. I am going to spend a little time with you today to talk about vaping and e-cigarette use and what you need to know as a future teacher about this topic. So before we dive in, I want you to take just a couple seconds to think about what do you hear people saying about vaping? Whether that's maybe your classmates, um, think back to high school, what you heard other people in your classes saying, um, maybe if you have young people in your lives or even maybe older folks who are trying to quit with them. Um, some of the things that I hear people say or that people share when we do this in person is that it's safe, it's no big deal. Um, if people don't think it's safe often, well, it's safer than cigarettes. Um, we used to hear people say a lot, well, it's just water vapor. Um, luckily, we hear that less now. Um, we hear everybody's doing it from high schoolers is something we hear a lot. Um, and so what we know is that there's a lot of cultural narratives out there about vaping, about e-cigarettes, and that a lot of it uh, may not necessarily be true, or um, th there's a lot of m confusion and misunderstanding. And so we'll cl hopefully clear a lot of that up with the presentation today. So let's talk a little bit about e-cigarette trends and what's happening. When e-cigarettes were first introduced back around 2007, uh, people had two opinions on kind of what they would do. There's one group of folks who thought e-cigarettes are going to be great for adult smokers to help them transition to something that they think is safer or to quit. Um, and so they thought these are great. These are so going to help adults. And then there's another group of folks who thought, you know, these could be really dangerous for young people. They could be really appealing. And I think that they're going to lead more young people into being addicted to nicotine. Um, and what we've really seen playing out here, as you can see in this latest data, that only about 6% of all adult, adults use e-cigarettes. We see much higher percentages, 22% of young adults vape, 19% of high schoolers vape. And so what we can see is that that first idea of like, oh, well, lots of older folks, you know, established adult smokers will vape is not necessarily playing out. But those fears around young people vaping really is what's happening. And so it's probably not surprising to you, I'm guessing a lot of you were in high schools recently, either through teaching experiences or, you know, as students, e-cigarettes are now the most popular form of tobacco use in Minnesota high schools and middle schools. Um, they're more than twice as popular as cigarettes. 19% um, of students report vaping, but what we know is that when we ask that question, um, we didn't always get the wording just right, and so the number might actually be higher than that. So it's certainly a startling amount of high schoolers who are vaping, it's a concerning amount, but it's also not quote unquote everybody, like we hear some people say. And so when we know about young people, when they think everybody else is doing something, sometimes they'll be more likely to do it too. So it's definitely enough teenagers for us to be scared about as the long-term health consequences, but it's also not everybody, and that's something important that you can emphasize with future students that is not the new normal, that it's still, you know, minority of kids who are vaping. So some other things that we know about vaping is that a lot of times young people aren't just using e-cigarettes. So about 60% of high schoolers who vape use both e-cigarettes and some sort of conventional tobacco product. So that's anything tobacco product you'd set on fire, like cigarettes, cigars, and flavored cigars, cigarillos, uh, hookah. So we see a lot of crossover between vapes and these other forms of tobacco that we know have a lot of very serious health consequences. And of course, you probably also know that nicotine is not the only thing you can put in a vape. So we see that 30 for 5% of high schoolers who vape e-cigarettes are also vaping cannabis. So we see a lot of crossover there as well. But the bottom line is that what we've seen and what research really shows us is over the past five or six years especially, the e-cigarettes have been a gateway into tobacco use and nicotine addiction for young people that um, that's what is playing out. Though It's not necessarily... Uh, concentrated in older folks, like people at one point wanted it to be, but it is young people getting addicted. And we also see that um, adolescents across the board are being hooked by nicotine. So if you think back maybe 10 years ago or so, people who smoked cigarettes oftentimes were people with other 
uh, other risk factors. So they were oftentimes people experiencing poverty, people experiencing racism or other discrimination um, with less supportive family structures or other things going on. Um, and now what we see is across the board, young people are experimenting with vaping and then it's not necessarily that same group of folks. So e-cigarettes really are changing the face of what adolescent tobacco use looks like. Um, but how do we get here to this point where 20% or probably many more of our high schoolers are vaping? Well, before we talk about the development of e-cigarettes, I just want to point out that no matter what e-cigarettes look like, they all work the same way. So all e-cigarettes have a battery. Most now are rechargeable with things like Jules and Sorens and others, but there are still some, and in the past there have been disposable batteries. Um, some e-cigarettes have a button. Most now are um, can automatically tell when you start to inhale. What happens is when you inhale or when you press the button, the battery turns on that battery heats up the heating element you can see in the middle of the e-cigarette there, which is in the nicotine liquid chamber. And so that heating element is touching the liquid nicotine in there and heats up that as well. And when that liquid nicotine is heating up, it turns into an aerosol, or some people like to call it a vapor, that you then inhale through the mouthpiece. So even though they look really different, all e-cigarettes from the older style to the new style all work the same way with the battery and a heating element that heats up the e-liquid. And so we've also seen a lot of changes since e-cigarettes came out, even though it was just about 10 years ago. So on the top left, you can see um, what we used to call sig alike. So those are those short three um, e-cigs together there. And these were the first times that e-cigs that were on the market. Uh, these are really small and compact. A lot of times they're pretty cheap. And when you buy them, you just take off a little plastic cap that comes on the end and you inhale and you're vaping already. And so these are disposable. You vape until they're gone and then you throw them away. The thing about these old cigalikes is they weren't very good at giving nicotine to people. So cigarettes are incredibly effective at giving people nicotine. That's why people get so addicted to them. And so when you think of early on adult smokers who are used to a lot of nicotine from cigarettes, when they tried using these cigalikes that didn't give them good nicotine, it wasn't very satisfying and they didn't like them very much. And so that's where we really quickly saw the development of what we call vape pens and mods. So the red uh, e-cig on the left-hand side is a vape pen. The black and purple one is more of a mod. And so these kinds of devices are refillable um, and rechargeable. So you can put in whatever type of e-liquid you want, and those could be different flavors, different nicotine strengths. Um, you can mix your own. You can also play around with the heating element. And when you do that, if it gets hotter, Sometimes that flavor is more intense. Uh, you get more of an intense throat hit from those. Um, and so those became popular because you had a lot more control and you got better nicotine delivery. Um, these are also the types of e-cigs where if you ever see people walking down the street and there's like a huge cloud that they exhale, um, that's this type of e-cigarette. But the thing is, if we were here together in person and I pass these around, you'd see like, they're kind of clunky, they're kind of big, they're not gonna fit in your pocket super well if you've got smaller pockets. Um, to refill them, it's kind of annoying and fiddly. And so when Juul came in the market in 2015, it was such a different experience. So Juul, which is on the top right-hand side, is sleek and small and easy to use. Um, it's, it really changed the game. And so with Juul, at the top, you can see that little black cap on top of the Juul. That's a pod. It's got all the liquid nicotine in it. You vape until the liquid nicotine is gone, and you click your pod out and throw it away and put a new one in. So it's a lot easier to use than the other devices where you were trying to, like, refill in small spaces. Um, it's also much more effective at giving people nicotine. We'll talk about that a little more in a couple slides. Um, and it's also much more discreet. So Juul is tiny. It's easy to hide in the palm of your hand. The cloud that you get when you're vaping is very small. And so it's easy for young people to blow it down their shirt or down their um, you know, shirt sleeve or their neck. Um, and so Juul has really changed the games just in terms of being much easier to use. And it's taken off and now makes up 70% of the e-cigarette market. And so you can see on the bottom are two different devices by the company Soren, the drop on the right, which is the blue one, and the air on the left. 
Um, and this is these are example of what refillable e-cigarettes look like more today. We still have some of those pens and mods that you saw on the left hand side. I'm sorry, the Sorens are on the right. But the Sorens on the right um, are much more fun looking. They come in different colors. The Soren drop fits right in the palm of your hand. So again, they're easier kind of to hide into the skies. Um, so even refillable vapes are looking very different now than they did say five, 10 years ago when these first started coming out. And then thinking about vaping, your device is one part, you have your jewel or your mod or whatever. The other part is what you're actually vaping. So the thing that you're vaping, e-liquid, um, e-juice, the liquid nicotine is made up of a couple things. The first is propylene glycol. The second is vegetable glycerin. It also has flavoring chemicals, and then it has nicotine that's extracted from tobacco plants. Um, and so a fun note is if you ever want to make a DIY like fog machine at home for like a Halloween party or something, vegetable glycerin is what you can use to make that, that like fog machine have fog. It's also the cloud that people are inhaling. And from that, hopefully you're deducing that like this maybe isn't something that you actually want in your lungs through vaping. Um, but just to touch on for a minute, these flavoring chemicals that are in e-cigarettes are pretty concerning. The first is because a lot of these flavors appeal to young people, you know, the peach rings and the Fruit Loops knockoffs and all of those. They have some that look like apple juice boxes, which is of course confusing to young kids, you know, very young elementary school type age kids. The other issue that we see around this is the health effects of flavors. So it can be easy if you don't think about it too hard to assume that like this monster va berry vape liquid I have on the screen, um, they took some strawberries and raspberries and they turned them into juice and they pressed them and now that's what you have. But this isn't, these are all flavoring chemicals. They aren't beautiful organic berries picked from the field. And so these are chemicals that are meant to taste like food products. And oftentimes these are deemed safe by the Food and Drug Administration for people to eat, but they aren't safe necessarily for people to heat up and inhale. So if you remember a basic science class, when you, you heat things up, oftentimes they can, they can change, the chemical properties can change. And then breathing them into your lungs is very different than what it is of eating them. So a little story for you um, is actually around a flavor that's used oftentimes that has like a buttery or a creamy flavor. Um, it's called diastol. And so diastol actually used to be what we used to in flavor, the buttery flavor for microwave popcorns. But what happened is in those popcorn factories, workers started getting sick. They had really bad respiratory and lung conditions. People were having a hard time breathing and the doctors couldn't quite figure it out. Well, with a little digging, what they learned is that diacetyl, that buttery flavoring they were using in the popcorn factories, when it got heated up in the factory and workers were inhaling it, it was actually giving them something called bronchiolitis obliterans, which is awful for your lungs. There's no treatment. If it gets bad enough, the only thing that you can do to treat it is a lung plant transplant. So it's super serious. And what we saw is that these factory workers were getting it through the diastole that's being heated up and inhaled. That's why we call the condition commonly popcorn lung. You might've heard of it before. So early on, especially in e-cigarettes, it happens less now, but these e-liquids, oftentimes people used diacetyl to give them the buttery or creamy flavor. So even though we know that the process of heating up and inhaling, which is exactly what happens when you vape, can give you this irreversible, awful lung disease, people were still putting this flavor into their e-liquids. And so this happens a little less today with diacetyl. It can still be in these. Um, but there's thousands of other flavoring chemicals that are being used in these, and we just don't know what the long-term health outcomes of all of the, these are. But we do know that some of them seem to have health impacts and that these flavors themselves are a real problem in terms of people's like lung and heart health. So let's talk just a little bit about the health risks of nicotine, and then we'll chat more about Juul and the health impacts of vaping generally. So nicotine is a really powerful drug. If you think of other drugs and how they addict people, nicotine does the same thing. So when you inhale nicotine from either an e-cigarette or a cigarette, it goes into your lungs and that very quickly transfers into your bloodstream and makes it up to your brain in about 10 seconds. 
And when that nicotine gets to your brain, it latches on to these nicotinic receptors and it releases dopamine. And I bet if you think back to some of your other classes, you'll know that dopamine makes you feel really good. So you get nicotine within 10 seconds, your brain feels great. You, some people feel kind of like a high buzzy feeling. Some people feel really calm, but generally people like the feeling. The problem is your brain really quickly wants more nicotine. So it will need more nicotine to have that same feeling, that same feeling of feeling good. Um, and it also quickly becomes that your brain doesn't know how to feel good when nicotine's not it in anymore. And so nicotine is really powerful, especially with young people, they can get hooked very quickly because their brains are still developing and you know their physically brains can change more quickly when you're younger. Young people become addicted to nicotine very quickly. Um, and then you're, you're hooked. Your brain needs that nicotine to feel good. And so not only is nicotine really addictive, the other thing is that nicotine can actually hurt adolescents' brain while they're still developing. So young people who are exposed to nicotine can have long-term issues with learning, memory, and attention. And those are skills that are really important no matter what you want to go on to do in your future life, not to mention important to be successful in these classrooms you're going to be trying to manage later on. And so nicotine in small amounts is very addictive, but has like a kind of not super huge effect on your body. But nicotine in huge amounts is actually a poison. So if you vape or drink or have too much nicotine in your system, it can be really harmful. And so one thing that used to not be true is that we used to not have to have child safe packages of nicotine. And what happened is we started to see more and more nicotine poisoning of young kids because these e-liquids taste like strawberries and cotton candy and cereal. And in 2014, an 18th month old child actually got into an e-liquid in their home and they drank it because it tasted good. And they ended up dying, which was incredibly tragic. And so after that, we've had to have safety caps on e-liquids, which has been a really good step. But sometimes kids are resourceful and they can get around it. And that kids and pets, can, when they get this, can be very, very sick, require hospitalization and many other um, interventions. And then the other thing we've started to see is now that we have higher nicotine e-liquids like Juul, we also see young people who can get really mild to sometimes moderate nicotine poisoning from just vaping too much. And so a lot of times kids will call this being nick sick. Um, you can get a headache, nausea, your heart can race, so you can breathe really quickly. It doesn't feel good. It's very uncomfortable. Um, and so a lot of times young people who are vaping too much will give themselves mild nicotine poisoning um, just by having too much. So when people sometimes compare nicotine to coffee and they're like, it's no big deal, like it's just like coffee. That's not actually true. Nicotine can be fairly toxic and is much more addicting. So um, nicotine isn't harmless in the way that sometimes it's mischaracterized as. So some of you will know the answer to this question right away, um, and others you may not. But when we think about how much nicotine is in one jewel pod, which are super tiny, they're like the size of a nickel, they're very small. Um, in that one little jewel pod, there's as much nicotine as an entire pack of cigarettes. It's a huge amount of nicotine in there. And what happened, and part of the reason why jewel is so popular, is that jewel figured out a whole new way to deliver nicotine. It's called nicotine salts, and it has to do with the way that they extract tobacco or nicotine from tobacco plants. Um, and so Juul's been very successful at extracting this nicotine, which makes it both more available to people so your body is more able to pick it up. You can see here that the orange spike is that quick spike in nicotine you get when you smoke from a cigarette, like I talked about, it takes 10 seconds, so you get a big rush, People think, you know, that feels really good in the body short term. Well, that pink line is Juul. So Juul also gives you that quick spike in nicotine and it feels, you know, you get that rush of nicotine. Unlike the blue line, which is many other brands where like you don't get that spike. Um, and that rush is a big part of why it's addictive. So one thing that Juul does is it makes that nicotine more available, you get that big rush. The other thing about Juul is that 
Um, nicotine salts aren't harsh on your throat in the way that older generations were. So with older generations of e-liquids and vapes, um, if you vape too much nicotine at one time, too quickly, if you got it too hot, it didn't take much to kind of have a burning in your throat and it felt bad. And then people didn't want to do that much more. So people kind of naturally limited their vaping because then their throat would hurt. Well, it's not true, Jewel. I've seen like people do things where they see how long does it take me to vape an entire Jewel pod or how much Jewel can I vape in three minutes or something like that. And so the fact that Jewel doesn't give you this throat pain is actually like encouraging young people a lot of times to vape more. And one of the things that's really concerning about this is one, kids are getting hooked more quickly on nicotine. And the second is that when kids and young people use high nicotine vapes like Juul, what we see is that those young people are more likely to go on to smoke and vape at higher intensities. And so when we think about kind of this continuum, kids are getting hooked on Juuls, which taste like mangoes and have health effects we'll talk about. And then they go on to smoke, which is, you know, even more addicting sometimes and um, has all of these health effects we know that will end up killing most people. So really discouraging to see this, this change. And then finally, I just want to point out that Juul is really busy spending money on commercials right now to make it look like they're the good guy and they just want to help people and they're just good community citizens. Um, and this isn't necessarily true. I could spend a lot of time showing you ads from 2015 that don't look like they're marketing to older adult smokers. It looks like they're marketing to you all. Um, they're bright and colorful and cute people and fun hashtags and parties and all sorts of things that are clearly targeting young people. And I think the other thing that is important to know about Juul is that they recently teamed up with Altria which used to be known as Philip Morris, one of the biggest of uh, big tobacco companies out there. And so now Juul is in partnership with people who make some of the most popular cigarettes too. And so it's hard to believe that they just want to help people quit smoking because they're teaming up with big tobacco, which we know has targeted young people and vulnerable folks for decades and generations. And I also just want to mention before we talk about some health effects here that there's really no meaningful regulation from the Food and Drug Administration or other folks on e-cigarettes right now, especially in terms of like what's in them. So a company could use diacetyl, which we know is very, very bad for your lungs, in their e-cigarettes, and that's just fine. There's no regulation on that whatsoever. They could have diacetyl in there and not list it in the ingredients because there's no requirement around what ingredients need to be listed, and that's just fine. And so it's hard because young people maybe want to make decisions about like, oh, I don't want to vape something with diastole in it. But they can't know because the FDA and other government agencies really just aren't doing their job in regulating these and making sure that these things are um, not safe, but at least people have the information and that we're minimizing some of these harmful ingredients we know are very bad. So let's talk about the health risks. The one thing I want to point out before I tell you some specifics of what we're seeing is that I don't know everything and nobody does right now. If you think about somebody who smokes, like within a few years, they'll start to maybe see some health effects, like maybe they'll have some shortness of breath or their teeth will yellow a little bit. But it usually takes someone who smokes like 10, 20 years of smoking before you start to see things like lung cancers and heart attacks and strokes, all those things we think about that end up killing people and being very severe. Well, e-cigarettes haven't been around for that long. We don't have long-term studies of people who are vaping for, for that long. And so our research really can't tell us yet everything that's going to happen in the long term. But we do know a few things. One thing that's been in the news this week when I'm recording this, it'll be a little older by the time you see it, is that we've seen some cases of teens and young adults being hospitalized with serious lung damage um, who also vape. And so while we don't know the exact cause in it yet, uh, these people have had serious lung issues. Some of them have had to be um, intubated where they put a tube in your throat to help you breathe. Um, we've seen some 
really serious injuries of people's lungs. And so um, these are still pretty rare. It's not happening to everybody who vapes, but um, it, it's very scary for the people who are experiencing it. Um, and what research is showing us is that vaping can hurt your lungs by starting to kind of shut down some of the natural defense systems you have. So when you go about the world every day and you're breathing like pollutants, like in the air, when there's forest fires and the air quality is bad, or when you're standing behind a bus, your lungs work hard to filter those things out and make sure that you aren't getting hurt. Um, but when you're vaping, it seems like your lungs are less able to filter that out. And we also see that people who vape have um, more illnesses more often like bronchitis and coughing and wheezing and pneumonia. So we see some of those like respiratory diseases people are getting more often. And young people, especially with asthma, who vape have worse and more frequent asthma attacks than people who don't. And so I can't tell you what 20 years of vaping is going to do to your lungs, but what I can tell you is that it doesn't seem like your lungs love having this in there. And there's definitely some health effects even in the short term we're seeing that are pretty serious. Research also shows us that e-cigarettes might be harmful to your heart and cardiovascular health. And so the details of this are kind of tricky and super medical. But at the end of the day, what we think we're seeing is that um, e-cigarette vapor is changing your blood enzymes in some of the same way we see cigarettes doing, and that that's an early indicator of damage to your heart and your cardiovascular system. So there could definitely be some long-term impacts for heart health as well. And then e-cigarettes, when we used to hear people say, well, it's just water vapor, that is super untrue. So e-cigarette vapor has a lot of the same cancer-causing chemicals that are in cigarettes. And so a few things that we see in these is formaldehyde. If you think back to your high school science class, if you had to do a dissection, that formaldehyde is used to preserve dead bodies in those dissections and also with you know, humans. Um, and it's something that can give you cancer in your lungs and other places in your body. Um, we saw, see volatile organic compounds, which are bad for you. Um, they can heart, hurt your stomach, your liver, your lungs, your heart. They can impact your entire body. Um, we see heavy metals that are in these. There's a, a specific thing, chemical called NNN, that in cigarettes, what we know is it causes um, a lot of the cancers you see of the throat and the mouth, and that that same chemical is actually found in the saliva of people who vape. So we could definitely see years from now, it wouldn't be surprising, young people who vape who have oral cancers and throat cancers, which are pretty awful to treat. And then e-cigarette, the nicotine can change brain development, but one of those heavy metals we see in e-cigarette vapor is actually lead. That heating element you might have remember from early on in these slides, it's like a little metal rod in the middle of the e-cigarette. Well, that actually leaches heavy metals like lead. And lead can have various serious impacts um, on brain development for young people, as well as their whole health. So um, e-cigarettes aren't harmless. There's a lot of different ways that it looks like they're impacting the body. And even though we don't know what the long-term health effects are, we can start educating young people now about what we know. And that when we give them this information, hopefully they can start to make better decisions about their own health. So what are some of the messages we can share with young people to hopefully help prevent them from vaping? One thing we hear a lot is, especially among like high schoolers, a little less so among middle schoolers, is that they think that vaping helps them their stress. So high school is an incredibly stressful time, and a lot of people think that this is like a coping mechanism. Well, the truth is when you become addicted to nicotine, when you go through that nicotine withdrawal, it actually is going to make the stress that people feel already feel worse. And so this is a great chance to tell, talk with young people and share that vaping actually isn't going to help with their stress. It'll make it worse. And work with young people to figure out what are some other healthy coping skills that they could use to deal with the stress that they're feeling. Another thing to talk about with young people is the chemicals that are in e-cigarettes and the health impacts. And so research is starting to show us that young people are concerned about the chemicals that's in e-cigarettes e and what's getting into their body. That's something a lot of young folks care about. And so to share with them 
there's formaldehyde in these. Um, there's these flavors aren't actually strawberries or whatever. These are chemicals that are aren't good for your lungs. To share that with people can be really helpful. Um, we also a lot of the young people in Minnesota who are hospitalized with that severe lung damage, they told their doctor that they thought vaping was safe. They they didn't know that it could have these serious health impacts. And so we need to be sharing with young people that there are and can be serious health impacts from vaping. And then finally, research tells us that talking about addiction alone might not be enough to prevent young people from vaping. What we do know is that when you talk about addiction with young folks, you really need to explain what it means. And so instead of saying like, don't do it, you'll get addicted, it's saying things like, well, people can become addicted really quickly. And that means that it'll be incredibly hard to stop and that even when people try to stop, a lot of times they aren't able to. So really spelling out what addiction means can be a helpful way to help young people understand the consequences of nicotine in e-cigarettes. And then unfortunately, the other side of this we need to think about is how do we help young people who are already vaping to quit? So that's a lot of times we call that cessation. So what do we do for young people who are already addicted? Well, one thing I'll tell you isn't gonna work is just telling them to stop and thinking they will. So if you imagine an adult smoker in your life, think about what would happen if you threw away their cigarettes and you said, that's so bad for you, it's gonna kill you. Why would you do that? Just stop. Well, most of the time that doesn't work. Most of the time they don't stop and they go out and they buy another pack of cigarettes and they still smoke because they're addicted and their brain is telling them they need that nicotine. The same thing is true for young people who are addicted to nicotine through vaping. And so a lot of times we think that if we just like lecture them and tell them it's bad and take away their jewel, they'll stop vaping. That's probably not gonna work. There's more we need to do for young people who are addicted. So when your body goes through nicotine withdrawal, so when you're addicted to a jewel or other product with nicotine and you don't have it anymore, you go through withdrawal and it can be very uncomfortable. So you can have really bad cravings for nicotine. People can be anxious, they can have anxiety or be irritable. People can have um, you know, a depressed mood, so feel depressed. People can have very serious headaches, it can be really hard to sleep. And so this can be really uncomfortable. And if a young person doesn't understand why it's happening or doesn't have the skills to cope with this uh, or support to cope with this, well, the easiest thing is to go back and take a hit of your jewel because you feel better afterwards. And so these symptoms are actually just a natural part of your body learning to feel good without nicotine. But in the meantime, for you know a week or a couple weeks more, they can be really uncomfortable. So sharing with young people that this is a normal process of their body finding a new equilibrium um, is a good way to help them know what's coming and be prepared instead of throwing them in the deep end and hoping they figure it out. Um, there's also a really great app out there called This Is Quitting. So This Is Quitting um, has resources for young people as young as 13 all the way to 24 years old. And there's a texting program that's really great. They also have a texting program for parents uh, whose young kids are vaping and they want to help quit. Um, they've got some online support as well. So this is a good tool that really meets young people where they're at um, and can be helpful in helping people who want to quit. And then finally, we need to think about like, what are our school systems doing to help these young people? So some schools recently have chosen to suspend students because this is, you know, in a lot of schools, like a violation of their drug and alcohol policy. Some schools are going as far as to expel students when they catch them. And what I'd really encourage you to do is think about not just how to punish students, but how do we help them quit? And so just expelling a kid probably isn't going to do that. So things that you can do is there when someone's caught vaping, instead of just expelling them, you could try doing a one-on-one -on -one meeting with a chemical health professional or other like school clinic staff. So having someone talk with them. Um, you could provide cessation resources. So things like that quitting program, counseling can be really effective. So the counselors in your school probably know how to do that. Uh, there's some other tools that people can use. So connecting them with those resources. Um, there's some education events, there's some community service. So what are ways we can help the student to quit instead of just punishing them when we catch them in school? Because if you think about it, for a young person who's very addicted, sitting through an entire school day trying to concentrate while going through nicotine addiction is 
or I'm sorry, nicotine withdrawal, it's going to be really hard. Like if they have a terrible headache and they're anxious and irritable and they just want nicotine, how are they going to concentrate through the whole lesson that you're teaching them and then through the whole school day? So we need to think not just about punishing students and telling them not to vape in school. Well, certainly those can be an appropriate part of a plan, but also thinking about how we can um, connect students with these resources and really support them in quitting so that they can be successful um, in having those healthy lives that we all want them to lead and they want to leave. And then finally, another thing we can do is educate students in school. So some schools have vaping as part of their health and other curriculums. Some schools don't. And it's really important that we start to educate young people that they have this information. So these are just a couple of examples of um, different resources and lesson plans you can look up later if you want to do this. Uh, the other thing I would encourage you to is not to think this is just the health teacher's job, right? So it's easy to be like, oh, they'll cover that. We don't need to talk about it. But if we can think about other ways to engage students in thinking critically about vaping, that's going to be really great. So we've heard of schools where like their science teachers are integrating us into the curriculum. So they're figuring out what chemicals are in there and they're doing some fun activities around those chemicals to start to think of it from a scientific perspective, right? Or, you know, the marketing that Jewel has used to hook young people and other has been really awful. So, you know, could there be room in your curriculum when you're thinking about kind of those cultural forces to talk about that target and marketing that tobacco and other people do and why that's bad. So definitely think about how you can be a part of this because we don't want a whole generation of kids growing up who are addicted to nicotine and have probably serious health consequences from vaping and getting hooked when they're young. The bottom line of all of this is to say that this is all super new. We don't have the answer yet of how to prevent kids from vaping or how to help young people stop, which you probably know and you've probably seen. So we're all gonna have to keep figuring this out together, but one of the best things that we can do is not ignore it. So we can all start to try what we can to address this problem and then talk with each other to share solutions. And that's gonna be one of the best ways that we can address this epidemic of course, along with engaging youth and really letting them help us lead the way. So we don't have any questions today because we're online, but if you do have any questions about vaping, I'm always happy to be a resource. And I hope that you leave this presentation feeling more prepared to talk with young people in your life about vaping and to be part of the solution with us. Thank you.